Hello. We're going to uh, continue our discussion of leisure experiences. So last class, we spoke about the properties of a leisure experience, uh, what constituted a good or optimal leisure experience. We spoke about um, common leisure experiences, like of interest and excitement, and we really talked about uh, flow. For the rest of today's lecture, we'll speak then about relaxation and fun sociability. We'll look at um, taking leisure seriously, and then uh, uh, finally, how leisure can ex change during an experience. So relaxation is often like low arousal. It provides a sense of freedom from disengaging in, you know, everyday activities. For example, you know, what is the word recreate? It means to recreate yourself. Um, so, you know, having a period of disengagement, um, and it's often viewed as kind of in contrast to work. Re relaxation, though, is often not valued in our society, in Western society, and it can be viewed as a waste of time um, in many cultures. Um, however, we know that relaxation is very important to health. But, of course, there's different types of relaxation. You know, um, for example, relaxing, doing yoga or meditation is certainly has positive health uh, benefits uh, in con contrast if you're like relaxing by you know watching TV. We can also look at leisure experience as being fun, social, and casual. Uh, people, uh, you know, activities provide people with feelings of comfort and happiness. These are typically um, activities that lack intensity or involvement. So they might lack some of the properties of leisure that are viewed as being optimal experiences, but that doesn't mean that they're not important to us. Um, these types of activities include play, relaxation, you know, napping, tanning, passive entertainment like TV or books or music, um, you know, even playing games, uh, just having a chat, um, having, you know, food together, going out for dinner, uh, or, you know, just doing something that's kind of, you know, just for fun, being silly. This really is, though, the most common form of leisure that we do. Um, and it's immediately intrinsically rewarding, meaning like you get the benefit like right away. There might not be a lot of long term benefits, though, or personal growth. So it's short-lived, pleasurable experiences that you don't really need special training to enjoy it. And research actually shows that these are very important to us. In fact, short, pleasurable experiences might be more important to our well-being than, um, you know, other forms. But these are hedonic, meaning they're, um, you know, you're, uh, they, they could be viewed as like flourishes, as unnecessary, um, where you're just doing it for the pure enjoyment or pleasure of the experience. So we're looking at um, leisure. We can view it as uh, taking it very seriously. You know, you can get very invested in it. And there are several theories. These include uh, serious leisure, specialization, and finally situational and enduring involvement. The concept of serious leisure uh, is developed by Stebbins, uh, Robert Stebbins. He is, uh, a, a, well, he might be close to retirement now. And when he was at uh, the University of Calgary, and he's actually a sociologist who has um, done a lot, though, in uh, leisure studies. He would, he's a sociologist who really views himself as a leisure researcher. So serious uh, leisure has been conducted on various topics, you know, the, and this is where you're looking at um, uh, serious leisure is when you're looking at being an amateur or hobbyist or volunteer activity that is sufficiently substantial and interesting that it could be viewed as a career, you know, where you're at the question acquisition, pardon me, and expression of skills, knowledge, and experience. So these are activities in a way that could be viewed even as a job, but you're not doing them, or something that you're very intensely engaged in. 
Um, Stebbins has done tons of studies on this. He's looked at, you know, people who baseball, hockey, people who did knitting, crocheting. He looked at um, football fandom, even barbershop singing, volunteer firefighting. He's interviewed people who were specialists in like goat breeding or dog shows, people who played chess, stand up comedy, um, unlicensed fighting, you know, like a. Uh, um, like on Fight Club, um, and collecting things. He, For example, he interviewed people who, one person who collected rubber ducks. But these are people then who it's a kind of, some of these, maybe not the collecting of rubber ducks as a hobby, but he's really then looking at um, things that could be viewed, though, as a career. For example, sport. So, there are six qualities of serious leisure. Um, first of all, there's careers. There's an enduring pursuit with their own background, contingencies, histories, turning points, stages of achievement or involvement. You know, uh, think of, you know, the, let's say, a career in sport. You're first in, you know, just your general children's lessons. Then you go into maybe the local league. And then there's like the minor leagues, etc. All the way up um, where you can eventually get paid. Um, and actually, it's no longer called leisure. Um, Stebbins argues that you cannot be paid for it to be viewed as leisure. There's perseverance. The determination to take part, succeed despite dis constraints. You know, think of when you're training for, let's say, a marathon um, and having to get up maybe at five in the morning to do your run. You know, it, that takes perseverance or you're a varsity athlete and all the practices that you have to do or having to say no to the party because you've got uh, a game the next day it takes perseverance. So there's significant personal effort in this. You have to you're working at knowledge, skills, uh, and training. You know, some people spend an extraordinary amount of money even to get these skills. Or, you know, you're working on learning your your hobby um, and, uh, you know, practicing. Serious leisure activities have durable benefits. They provide people with self-actualization, with feelings of accomplishment, self-esteem. They often involve social groups, like making friends and a sense of belonging. There's often a unique ethos with these things, like, you know, for um, there's special social norms, cultures, traditions within these worlds. You know, for example, uh, Stebbins um, studied uh, or uh, actually, pardon me, um, one of our grad students, Dr. Sullivan's, uh, Dr. Loeffler's students, um, he did his uh, master's degree on studying um, mag magic cards. So the world of studying magic. And then so there's obviously in that uh, the playing and collecting of those cards, there's certain norms, there's traditions, there's lingo that other people don't know um, what it is. There's also identification. So you identify, you feel a self-identity with that activity. I am a hiker. I am a crocheter. I'm a play, I play magic. I'm a basketball player. I'm a hiker. You know, you have a sense of identity with these things. Then there's specialization. Specialization is when you move from like being a novice or a beginner to higher levels of competence, com commitment, and involvement. So this is, again, it's a very similar theory to serious leisure. But it's looking at that, you know, in specialization, you overcome constraints. You develop um, preferences for the settings that you even do the activity. Um, and you get more specialized resources and equipment. Um, so, you know, for example, um, you know, my father is a, is a golfer. He is specialized in golfing. He has specific courses that he, you know, he's played many courses, but now that he's in his 70s, he has only specific ones that he wants to go to. He's specialized. He has, you know, certain types of equipment and, you know, he's not really into gadgets, my father, but he's got everything you can imagine for, for golf. 
Uh, and now that he's an older adult, he's buying specialized equipment to help him to be able to maintain um, being able to play golf. So there's uh, four stages in the specialization progression. So first you um, become, you're aware of the activity, then you start to adopt it uh, as part of your lifestyle. And then there's continued involvement and finally commitment, where it's really sh like co corely a part of who you are. Specialization differs from serious leisure in that participants don't involve themselves as much in the social world of the activity. So research on specialization focuses more on people's behavior rather than um, how they actually perceive or like the, the psychology of the deeper immersed experience. And finally, we can also look at situational or enduring involvement. So involvement is the extent to which people engage cognitively, emotionally, and behavioral with, with an activity. And this is product, place, or even service. And by the way, this, is, this theory um, really comes from marketing. So in marketing, you know, they're, they're really trying to get people to become involved so that they purchase products <laughs> or, or services. Um, so this is really when people have a special interest and it, it uh, folk, folk makes them drive and be motivated to do this. And this can be situational or temporary or it could be long lasting. There are three aspects then to enduring involvement. First is attraction. So this is the importance and pleasure that people have with the activity, the pull features of that activity. Then is centrality. So to the value, uh, to value relative to other domains such as occupation. So meaning you start to view the activity that you're involved in is just as important as other things in your life. It's central to your life. And finally, a self-expression. So that's the extent to which your identity is reflected in it. You know, um, for example, let's look at Dr. Loeffler. If you've had her, she is a, and many of you probably maybe have had her when you were in grade four, like come to, to speak to your class. You know that she is an outdoors person. Um, that is part of who she is. You don't just know this from how she talks and what she does, but, you know, the clothes she uses, the equipment that she has, how her office looks, you know, it's obviously part of her self-expression. The final topic for leisure experiences is looking at how experience changes during leisure engagements. So this is monitoring the actual on-site, real-time nature of experiences, looking at how the meaning and the experience can change during an activity. So uh, some researchers did an on-site survey of moods. They uh, were interested in does moods how do, does mood change over the course of an experience? And they had students um, go to, like on a field trip uh, just outside of um, town, you know, out of the city. And they had them then record their mood, traveling to the site during the activity, you know, all, all throughout the, the day and then on the travel back. And they hypothesized, they thought negative moods would totally just go down during the activity and positive moods would go up and it would be a linear effect. So, but this is not actually what they found. They found, um, you know, so they looked at negative moods included uh, anxiety, aggression, sadness and skepticism. And the positive moods were elation, surgency, surgency is like self-confidence, and vigor. And they looked at this over at time, so travel to the marsh during and travel back. And they did not find exactly what they thought. They found that 
Um, positive moods increase during anticipation, travel to, and on-site phases. But positive moods rapidly decreased in the travel from phase. And they found the opposite then from, for um, negative moods. So they had less negative mood during anticipation travel and during the activity, but it actually, the negative moods increased. So basically they, they found that um, negative moods, uh, they decreased kind of while they're in the park, but then they increased later on. Whereas positive moods were very high at the beginning and gradually decreased. Why would this be? Well, it's that you've got high positive moods when you arrive. You're so excited. The anticipation is the best part of the trip. And when you leave, you're tired and you're less enthusiastic. So usually your mood is, is less positive near the end of an activity. So leisure really then is a multi-phase experience. And this is important when we're helping to plan or facilitate leisure experiences. So we have anticipation. This is the period of imagining or planning the trip or event. You know, think of, uh, you know, even doing a, a, a vacation. You know, you're looking up on the websites, looking things up, maybe reading some travel books. You're in anticipation. Then you have your travel too. So actually getting to the site. And, you know, think about what's that experience like? Was it easy to get there? Did you have to do a plane? Were you driving? Was it a long road? Was, uh, you know, was there parking? <laughs> or, you know, was the walk pleasant to there? Then you have your on-site experience, which is the actual activity, which is usually what most people think about. But here I'm emphasizing that it's a very long experience. Then we have travel back. So this is your return, your, your trip home. And, you know, typically we view that as, uh, you know, it um, might, we might feel like it takes a, a long time usually <laughs> or short. And then finally is recollection. So uh, even remembering the activity. And actually we know that um, positive emotions can be experienced just by remembering, just by recalling the activity. So how can we use this in the workplace? Well, we can use it by creating very optimal experiences. So for example, let's say I'm running a children's camp. I can do anticipation. I can, um, you know, in my marketing, let's say I have children signed up, I can start to uh, send um, pictures of a camp. I could start telling them stories of some of the things that we're going to do. It's basically priming them to be excited, you know, sending them the list of things that they need, um, you know, getting to know them. For example, uh, I can remember, I, I still even have the letter. My, when I was around um, 11 or 12 years old, I had a counselor who wrote me a personal letter. And she wrote to all of the kids she knew that were going to be in her cabin, saying how she was excited to um, get to meet us, etc. And what a great uh, camp experience we were going to have. My point is, I still have that letter. I even still remember her name. You know, that's how strong emotion that was and that anticipation of that camp experience for me. Then you have travel too, you know, did you provide them with good instructions on how to get there? And is there good parking? You know, um, uh, was, you know, yeah, think of like the works, um, you're a senior and you're going to the works. Were you able to find parking? Was in the winter, was everything salted and everything cleared? You also have to think about, um, your, uh, Changing facilities, in a way, is kind of a travel to, or it's just kind of a transition between travel to and on-site. You know, that's part of the experience. When you walk into the building, are there nice pictures? Are there plants? Um, is the change room clean? This is all part of, ex of an experience. You know, there's nothing worse than, for example, going, I'm a swimmer, you go to a swimming pool, you're 
I can't wait to get in the water and the washroom is just really disgusting and you know you got the eebie-jeebies um, and you got to go in the pool and, and if that's gross water that's even worse. So then you have your on-site experience which unfortunately is often what we only think about facilitating. Then you have you know um, travel back so you could think about um, you know making you know well, uh, many of the same uh, experiences as travel to would be there. But then finally is recollection. So if I was running a summer camp, for example, I could um, send pictures of camp, uh, send, make a little scrapbook um, or a, pay, a PowerPoint presentation and send it to them. And that would prime them um, to have positive memories. And then, of course, you know, if we're thinking of this as a, whether you're for profit or not, you know, that child is more likely than going to want to come back to that summer camp experience, you know, ask their parent um, if they can go again, and the parents will be more willing. So make sure that you really think about the whole experience that people have to um, participate. Um, and that means from getting not just uh, being in your office or in your building, but, you know, how are they getting there? You know, is it uh, accessible? Is, uh, is there, are there bus routes, etc.? So for the exam uh, and quiz, you need to be able to identify and discuss the properties of leisure. This is probably more like a multiple choice question. And please make sure you don't care, uh, confuse these with the characteristics of flow should understand the four common leisure experiences. So interest, excitement, flow, relaxation, and fun sociability. Make sure you really understand the optimal experiences. Make, uh, you should be able to understand the two theories like peak experience and flow uh, and how to apply these. There's certainly gonna be questions on flow, pr probably a little short answer. It's one of the main theories that is used in um, leisure studies. So you should be able to um, figure out the difference between all those different theories. For example, be able to identify the six qualities of serious leisure and as well the aspects of enduring involvement. Uh, make sure you know the difference then. What's the difference between serious leisure, specialization, and in situational enduring involvement? you be able to identify those on a multiple choice question. And finally, um, be able to identify uh, leisure experiences as multi-phase, understand that. And then there's uh, you know, several terms there that you should be able to know for a matching of terms. And that's our unit then on leisure experience. Um, and of course, make sure, you know, not just for the quiz, but this was a, a lot of core theories were introduced in this unit, and you're going to see them continually used for, for uh, throughout the course. We'll uh, be seeing more how they apply over the lifespan.